Hello everyone, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the age of digital disruption. We have done it to the uh, stamp, the telegram, the travel agency, the conductors on buses, and uh, the lift boys, and we tend to digitize everything we can digitize. What do I mean by digitizing? We basically put it on a computer, and, or on the internet, we, put, we base it on processing power and on smart algorithms instead of uh, human labor. So basically, we also place it on Moore's law. Because Moore's law, you remember, was that old observation. It's by no means a law of nature. It's an observation that computer chips are basically two-dimensional structures. So whenever we increase density on them, we actually increase uh, the computing power in an exponential nature. And that's what has been happening with everything we have touched in the digitization. And thereby, usually when we digitize something, it gets very, very fast and very strong. So basically, when we look at linear growth over time, linear growth of performance of anything, and we start to digitize it, uh, and we, you have seen it during your lifetime. We have seen it in photography, for instance, where Kodak Eastman had one of the first teams that actually did digital photography. Um, we find that this exponential curve for a while is not as good. You have 10,000 times 10,000 uh, pixels in the uh, photograph. You have 100,000 times 100,000. But then finally, the exponential growth basically hits the linear growth curve you know from the established industries. And that's the moment people very often refer to as the iPhone moment because after that there is this chaos and amazement in the existing industries. People say, we don't know what hit us. Why has this changed so fast? We didn't see it coming. Um, and many of the old business models basically get fully disrupted, um, like the business model of the 36 exposures, which were more expensive underneath the Eiffel Tower, obviously. Um, and if you look today at photography, most of the traditional photography businesses have ceased to exist. But other things are happening in this area. Usually when we digitize something, we make it free of charge. It gets very ubiquitous. So um, if you may want to show me a show of hands, who has brought at least 5,000 photographs with you today? Can you show me? Oh, I see a lot of hands in the room. Of course. Now for a moment, imagine that we would have come here today with 5,000 photographs each in the analog world, right? We would have big binders of photographs. What are you doing, darling? Oh, I'm going to this conference thing, and I'm, as always, taking all of my photographs with me. Why on earth are you taking all these binders? Well, because uh, someone may want, to show, uh, I want, may want to show one of these photographs to someone. So basically, um, whenever we digitize something, it gets omnipresent. We are erasing the old business models and replacing them by new ones. And that's what I call digital disruption. Um, and usually it gets free to use, and we invent new business models. Um, think of Instagram or others. Now, artificial intelligence is digitizing the automobile driver. It's a digital disruption of the driver and of the steering wheel. And this is not evolutionary, this is revolutionary. When we in Europe started to build these five faces in the traditional automotive industry of self-driving, which are now SAA levels. The same year, um, Google came up with an automobile that had no steering wheel. So this is not evolutionary. This clearly is revolutionary. It basically jumps over everything we have thought about in the traditional automotive industry. And um, the IT-minded folks at Google, which were not automotive engineers, built this. Today, here in Germany, 1.8 million jobs depend on the automotive industry, uh, while, which is making up about 10% of our GDP, roughly, directly and indirectly. Now, interestingly enough, 95% of all money that goes into artificial intelligence driving goes to the United States and China. In 2015, NOAA conferences have counted how many disruptive startups in self-driving were funded. And in the mobility sector, they found that more than 95% of the money went to the United States. So we are now living in an area where there are huge bets made 
and it's very well funded in China and the United States, and there are unprecedented numbers. Waymo orders 62,000 cars from Fiat Chrysler. I, th I believe no one ever have or has ordered 62,000 vehicles. Why would you? Um, not enough, they ordered another 20,000 uh, Jaguars on top. Um, Uber signed a deal for 24,000 vehicles. Um, GM, which bought Cruise Automation, now said they were, have $80 billion to be invested in self-driving. These are very substantial numbers that go far beyond anything we do here in Europe. Um, and this basically shows, this is a substantial part. If these get to be robo-taxis, then this, this will replace a substantial part of the overall taxi fleet of the United States. And they're already rolling with passengers on board. So why do they do this? Why do they go for these large fleets? Because AI-based driving is based on fleet learning. Since the inception of the AlexNet in 2012, which basically shifted the paradigm of artificial intelligence to deep learning and reinforcement learning as the main characters, we know that it's not that important to basically program AI than to train AI. And for training, obviously, you do most of the training in a computer simulation, but you need real kilometers, real miles on the road to train. This is why we see these large fleets piling up, because they learn from the real incidents of the road, from the so-called edge cases, that basically teach the cars how to drive. Now, if you look at Google alone, which probably is a world leader, they started with 1 million miles in um, June 2015, 2 million miles, uh, took them more than a year to get to 2 million miles, then they went to 4 million miles in uh, about a year later, that was 11, 2017. Uh, they went to 8 million miles. Uh, less than a year later, they are now well beyond 10 million real-world miles. These are real-driven miles, as opposed to much, much more, of course, in the simulator. Now, Tesla just announced in a nice conference um, with uh, industry analysts that they have uh, installed a so-called shadow mode and that they train the AI in shadow mode which means that whenever a human driver drives a Tesla, the autopilot is on in the background. So while you're driving that steering wheel of the Tesla, the autopilot also plots out a trajectory for the vehicle and it gets compared which one of the two trajectories are better or match actually. If they match, they throw the data away, but if they don't match, so if the human driver does something else and the autopilot of a Tesla, they upload this to the uh, Tesla uh, data center and start analyzing why you drove differently than the car would have. Basically, um, this gives them the ideal base to train vehicles now in the real world, and every Tesla driver in the world now starts to basically build up this, in, uh, um, this enormous amount of mileage that the AI network is based on. So if you just look at how many miles were driven in the shadow mode, so by human drivers training the AI network of a Tesla, they just announced one number, and that is that they went 1.6 billion miles in July of 2018 already. And this also follows, obviously, an exponential curve um, and the rollout of the Model 3, as you may know, note, uh, just started at that point. So, Opposed to rule-based systems, AI systems learn from the fleet and from human input into that fleet. They require much less programming and more learning than non-deterministic. And since AlexNet, a lot of games have been played. Uh, among them chess, among them Go, if you think about what Google did with DeepMind. And all of these games gradually, time after time, were lost by humans. The computer, which is trained in a deep learning and reinforcement learn time a learning type fashion usually wins against the human, even in the most complex games we play. The only question now that remains is, is human driving a game? And how much time do we really have for that shift? So if you look at New York City in the year 1900, you would find this. A lot of horse carriages on the streets on Broadway. And obviously, there was a crazy person on that picture. Yeah, someone who's living in the future, you know, some... Uh, look at this. 
a carriage without horses. Crazy, right? Crazy innovator. In 1900, the predominant discussions about traffic circled around horse poo and the amount of horse poo horses would give to New York streets. How much time did we have for that seismic shift in that industry? Well, this is 1910. Can you see horses? Well, maybe. I'll show you one. This is the only last carriage. That's a really old school person, right? Riding a horse carriage. What did happen in the meantime? Well, most of the companies that had to do with horses, horse riding, horse growing, carriage making, horseshoe making, went bankrupt. Most of them did not survive that seismic shift because the skill sets were totally different. The skill sets of raising a horse or making horseshoes has nothing to do with making tires or wheels for an automobile. The, st the skill sets needed were now petrochemical, they were machinery, they were gears, all the stuff you needed to make a car. Even if you made an axle on a carriage, the axle would be torn by horses. Now you needed to make an axle that actually would have talked to it and drive the car itself. So basically, no horseshoe makers, no carriage makers left, and the horse poop crisis gone too. In Europe, we had a very similar situation. I worked for a company that made uh, smartphones when the iPhone arrived. And we showed that device to our managers and we said, well, look at this. This is really interesting because it shifts the whole business model, right? Because it basically digitizes all the function. Now, other people can give you a function to that phone. They can write a so-called app. And actually, in the future, maybe all of the other companies will make apps, but not we as a, as a smartphone maker. And they said, no, 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 this is not sustainable. This will not change the industry. Um, when Google imitated very quickly with the Android models. Obviously, they were the two only companies that are dominating today's smartphone market around the world. Um, so, do we have a chance in the traditional industries? AI driving systems will be 10 times safer and more capable than rule-based systems. Today, we use rule-based systems mainly in Europe. The European traditional car makers believe that these non-deterministic AIs they may never be safe for public roads because they're not deterministic. You don't know why they made an accident if there is one because they learn from fleet. We believe when AI-based driving takes over, it will be too late for the European car makers. And of course, the regulators and lawmakers hate non-deterministic systems. They have no idea how to license them really. And now the question was, how can we make a startup for AI-based driving in Europe, how can we drive today's cars with artificial intelligence? And the first problem you encounter if you start a startup company in the midst of Europe that does artificial intelligence-based driving, that is that you have no car to drive, right? These cars are relatively closed. So we spent our first year, we founded our company about three years ago, we spent our first year just hacking cars. So we were suddenly professional hackers so we bought vehicles, and we were so happy when we could drive hands-free. This is from a testing ground somewhere. See that? We hacked the vehicle, and we had this driver with friends, you know, that made us help, that gave us help to understand how the vehicle looks like, and we started to drive the car by true AI. Then, when we felt more confident about it, we actually equipped a regular Volkswagen Golf, without telling Volkswagen, we just used it, with cameras around it, with a NVIDIA supercomputer in the back, and we started a test drive to, a to draw some more attention. We drove from Ingolstadt to Wolfsburg, without telling Volkswagen. And then in Wolfsburg, we announced we had done this, and we actually got some press coverage. This was auto built. This is when the car industry called us and said, what are you doing there? Do you want to work with us? It looks like you really want to help us to understand how AI-based driving works. Well, today we are uh, licensed uh, to be, um, among others, to be a supplier to Volkswagen. We have a Volkswagen a supplier number, and these are very nice folks. They help us. They work with us. So long gone are the days when we had to hack cars. And we even work with some of the most beautiful vehicles in the world. Um, this is an AI remote driving case, which we did 
which helps you to drive the car at first in a simulation environment. It's a very nice and beautiful Porsche Cayenne, which is driven here through a Porsche facility. And then we take it from simulation into the real world. This is a drone filming a real car in exactly the same location. So we train the artificial intelligence in the computer simulation, very much like a computer game environment. Like a baby, it starts to learn to drive, not to hit other objects. And then, of course, once it has learned all this, we can translate it to the vehicle, and miraculously, it starts a today's production vehicle to drive itself by artificial intelligence. We can go back to simulation, back to reality, and it should match. Why do, do we do this? Well, because this nice Porsche car here um, had the feel it needed an oil change. So it is seeking um, the place where it needs to go to get an oil change. It'll activate itself, and it will go there with nobody at the wheel and place itself in the garage facility just in the right place for an oil change. And this is something the traditional car manufacturers can relate to. They say this makes a lot of sense for us because we have all these repair places and would be really nice. So next time you feel that your car needs to go to a garage, you may see it you know, some of these other vehicles driving themselves by AI remote control by the facility to the repair place with nobody at the wheel. Now, who of you rode a horse to work today? Because I believe that human driving Manual driving will be very much like horse riding in a while. We will do it on nice and beautiful days. On Sundays, you'll impress your grandchildren. Hey, look, stick shifting, great, huh? And of course, we will not outlaw manual driving. We never outlawed the horse riding on public roads. It doesn't get, it's crazy. It doesn't have a license plate. It doesn't have a backlight, and it's still allowed. Who of you rode a horse today to come here? No one, because it is not convenient, it disturbs traffic, and it's just a thing of the past. So, what can we do? Well, defending the status quo is no option. Um, when the horse people were reacting to the first steam cars in Britain, they basically introduced the so-called Red Flag Act, which required a human being to wave a red flag in front of the car and say, hey, danger, automobile approaching, restricting the car to uh, walking speed in Britain. Of course, this law didn't hold for long because people were driving cars already in London, uh, not in London, obviously, but in Paris and Berlin. Um, so there's still hope. We can still turn the change of events, but the consequence is very clear. We have to believe in AI-based driving. We should not fight this disruption which is coming up. We should embrace this disruption because it is clearly coming. It's a function of Moore's law. It's a function of exponential learning, fleet learning. And we will probably have less than these 10 years you saw between 1900 and 1910 till our roads will totally change. But now we should start building the new business models, very much like starting to build Instagram and not keep selling photographic film. Thank you very much for your attention.